Hi, my name is Tom Shadiak. Welcome to Minds of Mountain Film. I'm speaking today with Erwin Kula, who is an eighth generation rabbi. Count them, eight generations. How many years in a generation, approximately? Uh, 25. 25, a lot of generations, a lot <laughs> of years. Um, he is in a film that's here at the festival called Time for a New God. And we're gonna have a conversation today about what it means. What do you mean by this idea of a new God? Well, I can already feel yeah. people at home going, <laughs> time for a new God. don't mess with my God. <laughs> right. So. Well, it, since God's been messing with us, it's time for us to mess with the gods. You well, know? tell us, tell us but, what you mean. Cause you have a very powerful I, statement about yeah. this, I think. I think that, that, that we're, everybody knows something's going on. We're in in between stage. And, and for many people, the inherited conventional way in which we think about God, you know, kind of a God in the sky sometimes when I'm a little bit of a nastier mood, you know, I say the peeping Tom, voyeuristic, reward and punishing God. I think mm. for a lot of people, that God in the sky is over. That mm. image of, of God is over. But that doesn't mean that we don't ask really serious questions about what life's about and what is being human about. And, mm. and so it's time for us to reimagine our gods. Mm. And uh, the most important thing for me is I think God's gotten so small that people are fighting over, kind of like when you fight over the last scraps, mm. we're fighting over a God that's so small, mm. as opposed to imagining a God that's so big that we're all included in the inside. Yeah, well, just the word God brings up so many emotions yeah. in people. So I was raised in a Christian Catholic household. My God is judging your God because yeah, you're right. raised in a Jewish household. Right. And I know we know as people that there are things beyond that. Well, one of the things we have to do is we have to move from creed and dogma to experience and storytelling. And I, I, I say that, that, that what's happened is very often the people who have inherited religions right now uh, are, are very dark in many ways mm. and, and they are very judgmental. Mm. And so God has become a kind of toxic word for mm. a lot of people. Mm. And when I say, so let's not, let's not use the word God mm. for the next hundred years. Let's, let's put the word out. And instead, every time that we imagine using the word God, let's talk about the experience. So anytime I was, mm. anytime you want to say, oh God, okay, tell me about the experience. Mm. And then here's what you learn. Oh God, you know, you're, you're making love and, and at that moment, climb, oh God, oh God, oh, so that's an interesting time when God mm. comes to mind. Mm. Uh, you're, you say somebody's sick and you say, God bless you. Oh, that's interesting. I want you to have health. Mm. Or, or, you know, you see a terrifying moment. You say, oh my God, some kind of terror. God. So it turns out God is just a word. It's just a code word for experience mm. felt very, very deeply. Mm. And now what's happened is the word God is blocking experience. Right. And, uh, and that's, what, that's actually one of the things that's interesting about film to me. And one of the reasons I wanted to do a film is that, that it seems that film in many ways is a new kind of liturgy. The same thing that yes. a prayer book or a liturgy did for people. They came in, let's say, to a synagogue or a church, and there was some prayer that made them say, oh God, or, or wow, something, let's say, beautiful about creation or the universe. Now, you can see a film and images of the galaxy, and you can see the images of the solar system, and, and you're blown away. Or you see a, a, a great story of, a, of human aspiration. Mm. Like I saw a movie, this, I actually saw a movie today, Prudence Music. Mm. Right? So it's, it's, you get to see the... You're saying, oh God, the whole movie. You're saying, oh my God, oh my God, this, this young woman is capable of, of such heroic heights yeah. using her talent uh, with such amazing disability. It seems that's where we can meet each other. In our it, stories. In our stories, exactly. And, and, and my, one of my favorite authors is a woman named Madeline Langle. And she said, Jesus was not a theologian. He was someone who came to tell us stories. And it, so he talked to us in stories. And as you said, now we have the power of film. To, to tell us stories. Are you finding that here? Are you finding a power here at this festival? Oh, I, I, I've seen five films already. And each film, and again, I'm not even talking about, the, I'm not a movie critic that can tell you about the quality of mm. the, the aesthetic and the artistic quality of the mm. film. But I can, I can tell you the quality of the storytelling, whether it's a, a, a story of Nico who has he has one foot and on crutches, he climbs the tallest mountain, mm. you know, or whether it's uh, uh, veterans from the Iraq, wasteland, which you the haven't wasteland. seen. I haven't it's seen a it. Beautiful tomorrow. film about people living uh, and making their living off of trash, but finding such dignity and humanity in that space. Well, here, see, that's where what I'm what I'm inviting people to think about is that is is that the God that we seek, those who are seeking God, is found at those moments. Yes. And what we have to do is kind of 
leave the churches, and leave, well, people are, thank God, mm. <laughs> leaving the churches, mm. leaving the synagogues, and actually go into real life with people mm. and listen to people's stories and, and watch how people are heroic because the most ordinary people in the world are so incredibly heroic. Mm. You, call, you say something that I think is uh, mystical. The mystics had the idea that everything is God in drag. Yeah. And, and if we could see that, I think that's what you teach. And, and, and it's, a, it's a powerful message. And it's the dogma that creates the wall. How do we get away from this dogma? I think the most important thing is people have to trust themselves. I've been all over the planet in the last year and a half. I was in the Persian Gulf maybe three months ago. And I had the most amazing experience. I was with a film festival, the Doha Film Festival, mm. connected actually to Tribeca. And I went to the film festival and I met with about 20, 25 aspiring, aspiring filmmakers mm. in that part of the world. And they were all between, let's say, in their late 20s, early 30s. And the conversation wound up being, how do we be global citizens and talk to our parents mm. about still maintaining the best of those traditions? And I found myself, over and over again just saying to people trust yourself mm. what creed and dogma does is it disconnects you from yourself mm. it keeps you from trusting yourself and it says for you to be a good person you have to believe what so and so said mm. or for you to to be loved you have to do what so and so says no. do you think that's a way of controlling yeah, absolutely it's a do. way of controlling yeah and by the way i don't even want to i understand nothing's founded as a desire in religion to control you know religions are never founded by their founders right. religions are founded by people way after the founders mm. Mm. and but part of what happens is like any system, systems become corrupt. Even the best motivated systems become corrupt. Mm. And then what we need is if people begin to see that, not to be crazy and angry and try to destroy things, but to trust themselves and build new things. Mm. That's the ultimate, is to have the courage, I think, to listen to yourself. I love Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's all about listening to that self-reliant voice. But these dogmas get so loud and noisy. See, I, I personally think we're afraid of the word religion in our culture, but even spiritual people are religious people because they do Absolutely. things religiously. Absolutely. They may meditate religiously. It's the dogma that says, no, 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 my God is right Better. and your God is wrong. You know, and if and you don't do it this way, you're going to hell. Or you don't do it this way, you're a bad person. Right, right. And I think we have to make it much simpler. You know, I think creeping featureitis has set into religion. Mm -hmm. Now, luckily, the truth is, the next generation, surely in the West, is moving away from this. Yes. And we see that in all. You know, the largest category in American religious identity is none right now. N O N E. It's the third mm -hmm. largest in the country, and it's the fastest growing religious identity, which is incredibly healthy. What is it called? None. Just a none. N O N E. Literally. None. It's, it's, oh, it's, none. Seriously, it's wow. a real category in right. sociology right now of religion. Right. None. And that's not people that don't. It doesn't mean they never ask questions about what's the purpose of life or what's life about. It means they're rejecting creed and dogma. Right. And the, the big thing for I always say to religion people is you got to separate your wisdom and your practice from your creed, your dogma, and your tribe. Mm. Because if your wisdom and practice is simply creedal, dogmatic, and about making you a, a superior member of some tribe, you're actually doing damage right now to the planet and other people. Mm. And even worse, you're doing damage to your own religion. Mm. You know, but there's a great amount of wisdom and great practices in these ancient religions, and but we got to loosen them from the metaphysics which are wrong, the God in the sky, the creed that's weird, the dogma that's judgmental, and the tribalism that's going to get us killed. Yeah, the differences seem to be beautiful, and 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 we can celebrate those, but it's the walls that we put up that, as you say, you you have this analogy. You say the guns get bigger. Yeah, I, I say that, that what's happened is when God gets very, very small, okay, we wind up having to fight, mm. right? And, and it turns out the guns have to get big as God gets small. Mm. If God gets very, very big for us, which is ultimately just another word for life and reality mm. itself, and that's why I say God is just everything in drag, you mm. know? Mm. God is just life in drag. Mm. If God can get that big, watch how human beings will need much smaller guns. Yes, and I feel like we know this intuitively. We've always known it. Yeah. it takes, you know, it's hard though. And, and evolution is, a, you know, the evolutionary process, whether it's psychologically or spiritually or ethically, takes a long time. And, and we've made tremendous advances. I yeah. mean, if you really look 50 years ago, 100 years ago, the way the world was, I mean, we are, we're taking a few steps backwards, but there's a lot more advance and a lot more human rights and, and a lot more capacity to help people. It's just that right now we're in a little bit of a difficult moment because there's so much fear and 
and fear generally, you know, we're still in the flight or fight response to fear right. most human beings. And well, I think that when a body is about to die, it kicks the strongest. Yeah, And exactly. I feel like we're, you know, we've used this word shift when right. we've talked privately, that there's a shift that's about to happen. And I feel it in the young people, Me as too. you said. I travel, I travel around college campuses, I feel it all the time, and I have a 22-year-old and an 18-year-old, and they are so much healthier than I was at 22 and 18. I mean, and I'm not just saying, I mean radically healthier. Right. Healthier in terms of comfort with people who are different, right. comfort with ideas from different traditions and different inheritances. They're just an entirely, they're like, it's almost like a different species, and it's, and it's, and I'm, and it's so, it's so hopeful. But you know, the flight or fight response is a very, very, you know, built-in response and so the shift itself which you can sometimes I compare to a moment of birth you know I have two kids I was in the I was in the room mm. you know birth is really 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 messy mm. it's bloody and there's a lot of cursing and and there's anger and people say things to each other they they don't even you know 100 mean they don't mean it and and they're gonna you know they're gonna be fine I say that I think we're in the storm before the calm mm. rather than you know I really I really do believe that the evolutionary process has some quantum moments where it's very disruptive, and we're in that disruptive moment. But if, if, if a number of us can stay cool and help the conversation along, not add to the anger, you know, whether it's filmmakers who are, who are, who are, making, films, who are making films about the shift, mm -hmm. whether it's religious leaders who don't diss their inherited religion, but take the best from it and, and help other people, whether it's doctors who say, you know what, I get it. You know, AMA is very, very important, but, but you know what, we're also gonna use some alternative you know, ways of, of healing, whether it's lawyers who say, I get it, you know, the justice system's fantastic and everything's okay, but you know, we need some mediation techniques and we need some other techniques. And, and if those of us who are beginning to see the ship, rather than fighting and, and adding to the anger, just build new stuff, mm. while mm. still respecting that which may be dying, I think we'll be better off. And that adds an energy, doesn't it? When you are angry, you want something so bad, you want a peaceful world so bad that you're angry, that adds an energy that fights against. All you're doing is adding the anger. Right. You know, and, and, I, and, and this is, there's a real difference between anger and, and maybe righteous indignation. Mm, mm. You know, and I always say to people, when you're, when you're finished being angry, do you feel better or worse? Mm. And the truth is most people feel worse. Mm. And, you know, they said something they didn't mean to say, they weren't as nice as they could be. On the other hand, when you're fighting for something and you're fighting hard, you know, when you finish the day, whatever you've accomplished, you feel better. And I think we ought to trust our own happiness on that. Mm. You know, I look at Cheney when he finishes speaking, he doesn't look happy. Mm. He really doesn't mm. look happy, mm. you know? And, and, and then I look, I listen to the speeches here of people who are, you know, they walk across the planet or they walk through every forest or, or they travel around the world trying to, to fix pieces of the world of which they are doing a, a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a step mm. each day. Mm. And they finish and they're joyful. Mm. So what does that teach us? Yeah, what yeah. Does it teach it's us? that experience that you talk about. If we talk and look and study the human experience we see who has the light That's right. and it's not often in the people with the stuff and the money and the anger and the competition it's the people who are cooperating and loving and telling stories and, and we know in ourselves you know without being judgmental just if you look in the mirror you know when you're more greedy or less greedy mm -hmm. when you're more kind or less kind and I think mm -hmm. what we have to do is help people trust themselves mm -hmm. about that in other words rather than saying you're not kind enough or you are too greedy mm -hmm. Invite people to, what does it feel like right now? Mm. Trust one's mm. feelings. What does it feel like now when you have, you know, you've been more generous than maybe you ever were before? Or when you actually forgave someone and it was a new experience and you didn't forgive like that mm. before. How does it feel now? Or when you were more compassionate than, than you may have been, you know, a day earlier or a year earlier. Mm. When you learn something new about uh, someone's opinion that you really disagreed with as opposed to just dissing, mm. how do you feel? And it turns out we actually feel better mm. and we feel mm. happier. So we should trust that. See, I think that's kind of how we're hardwired. I, I, think, I that think so. Somehow this creator has, at least at this point in history, said it's time to listen to that feeling you get. Yeah, and listen, every religious tradition, the, the best of religious traditions, teach. You have to listen. I mean, in Hebrew, mm, the most mm. one of the most important words is the word Shema. Mm. And the only creedal statement in the whole system is, mm. listen very mm. carefully, mm. those who are wrestling with God. Mm. It's all one. Mm. You know, so listen really carefully. Mm. You know, I saw a film yesterday that, that I, or I, I actually saw a slideshow yesterday in which just listening to the birds, listening to the yes. rustling of the leaves, yes. we don't do that. We don't, 
get alone, listen to someone else's heart. Yes. You know? It's those voices out there that are so strong in our culture. You know, kids are texting now a hundred times a day and they have messages coming at them and they have the television coming at them. Do you have success in talking to kids to help them to... I think two things. One, I, I think that the, one of the things our culture could use that's inherited from every religious tradition is we can use a kind of Sabbath. And I'm not talking about the Sabbath in which you go to church or the Sabbath in which yes. you go to synagogue or the Sabbath that you pray prayers that don't mean anything, but a kind of shutdown mm. from certain parts of, of, of the world so that one can listen more carefully. Mm. And I think that we're each going to have to figure out practices that help us kind of filter out so much that's coming at us. Mm. It's great so much that's coming at us. We have a lot of choice. It's, it's, so, it's fantastic to have so much opportunity and so much information and so much art and so much interesting stuff. On the other hand, it's really important to kind of shut down every so often. What I'm finding with, with kids is Digital natives, I really think, are different than digital immigrants. I'm a digital immigrant. I think I'm a pretty good digital immigrant and a pretty literate digital immigrant. But digital natives, what I think is, I think that they're actually separating more the wheat and the shaft than we imagine. Because my kids are capable and their friends are really capable of saying, no, that's nonsense, this is real. And one of the things that this age does is, is you trust your peers more than you trust corporations, you trust your peers more than you trust advertisers, mm. you trust your peers more than you trust authorities. And I think that if trust is the central currency between a generation, we're off to a much better start. Mm. That's beautiful. So I'm hopeful. This idea of a new Sabbath and a new God, it seems that if we get our, wrap our brains around this idea of experience, our spirits around this idea of, of, of experiencing a new God, we will invent a new Sabbath. Yes, absolutely. We will we'll invent new images, okay? We'll invent new practices. Some of, some of those practices will be re-kind of valued or renewed or re-traditioned mm. practices mm. from the past. Some will be brand new. Mm. Look, every culture needs a day in which to celebrate or to at least practice forgiveness. Mm. So it may be that the inheritance, one of the inheritances we take from the Jewish people to the next epic is the day like Yom Kippur in which we really do concentrate on forgiveness. It may be that one of the inheritances we take from the previous era is a day in which we celebrate the birth of a child because mm. any one of us watches a birth and we say, oh my God, well, that's that's a healthy Christmas, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so we may wind up taking the best from inherited traditions and then inventing stuff on our own. Mm. And that means that the, first, the last 300 years was a lot about industry and control and, and manipulating nature and, and, and solving a lot of great problems. I think the next epic is about poets and, and artists and philosophers and, and painters and sculptors and, and the people who ask kind of these questions about, okay, now that we have so much, now that we can control the world, we're the masters of the world in some way, now what? Mm. Now, who do we want to be on this planet? Mm. And, and how do we relate to that, to that woman in the hut in Rwanda? I was in Rwanda a year ago. How do we relate to that woman in the hut? Mm. Right? Because we're all in this together. And, and that's, that's, that calls for the storytellers, that calls for the artists, that calls for the poets. Mm. Now, what do you say to people who say, Irwin, you have a beautiful heart. It's just not realistic. You know, we have a world where there's really evil people. We have a world where there's a whole religion trying to kill this religion. What do you say to those people? Say, Erwin, I love you, but... So first of all, I say the greatest realism may be idealism, okay? Because to a realistic person who says, I said, so just tell me, how has war worked so far as a solution? Tell me how good war's been. Mm. And I don't, mean the, I don't mean this war, Iraq and Afghanistan. Tell me in general, for the human community, how good has the solution called war been? Mm. Now, the truth is the solution for war has not been such a great solution, mm. and it wasn't such a great solution in the 20th century. So let's do this. I recognize I'm not a mamby-pamby, new age character who says there's no evil. There is. But the most important thing about understanding evil is two things. One, it's never as large as you think. So if we have a problem now with a certain segment of the Islamic world, let's be very clear on who we have the problem with. Mm. We don't have the problem with the Islamic world. Mm. We have a problem with a very, very, relatively speaking, small group of Muslims. Then, let's ask a second question, and that is, is that evil just doesn't happen into the world. There's cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, mm. effect, cause, effect. 
So we better do two things. One, if there are people we really have to kill because they're going to kill us first, then that's why we have armies. They ought to be ethical, and maybe we have to do that. But while we're doing that, we should spend at least as much money killing people as we spend trying to understand the cause effect of why we've created a world in which people can be so distorted that they can have two kids and suicide bomb people. Mm. Because that is distorted behavior and it doesn't come simply from some metaphysical poof, you're evil. Mm. It comes from cause effect, cause mm. effect, and we ought to unravel it as best we can. And all killing people does is gives us the space to unravel it. It solves no problems. Mm. It just gives us space mm. to try to figure out, oh my God, how did we get here? Mm. And we better use that space smartly because you can never kill all the terrorists. You can never kill all the terrorists, mm. ever. It's not possible because mm. every terrorist you kill, you produce more terrorists. Mm -hmm. The only issue is do you get the space to be able to try to understand how we got to this moment mm. so we can kind of re-ravel it. Mm. Oh, I think that's beautiful. That is a conversation that I wish had happened after 9-11. I actually, I was on radio all the time begging. I said, here's two things. Don't, we may have to do a certain amount of fighting. If people really are going to kill us because we don't want to die first, but just remember, they're our projection. Just remember, mm. the evil out there is your projection. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes your projection isn't so reified. Your projection isn't so concretized. Your projection isn't so real that your projection is going to kill you, which means you, I'm not a pacifist. You do have to kill your projection before it kills you. But then you've got to remember, it's still inside of you. Mm. It's still inside of you. Islamic terrorism is not simply a product of evil people deciding we're now going to kill. And there was a lot of things that got us to this point mm. that that doesn't justify it. You know, that's what we have to be very careful. Liberals have to be careful. Nothing justifies suicide bombing. On the other hand, what conservatives have to begin to understand is that the fight response is not a sufficient response to solve problems in the human community. Mm. Do you see that dialogue starting to happen? Well, I think Barack Obama actually, th this country elected him. He did not say we're not going to fight. We're not pacifists. He's trying to hold together two things. Now, we can disagree about policy, but he recognizes we have to have a very serious diplomatic and attempts to win over the minds of people and actually take care of people. Even mm. today, there was an article in the New York Times on how the, the Black Hawk helicopters are trying to do EMS services for Afghanis because mm. the doctors there, they, 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 if a kid, an Afghani kid gets bitten by a, got a bit by a, some kind of snake and they, they rushed him to the hospital, you know, it's a fellow human being. So mm. we're going to have to do that at the same time. If there really are bad guys, all right, so we'll get the bad guys. But we have it out of whack now. We have billions and billions and billions of dollars going to kill the evil people and almost no money going to understand what's the cause effect and how actually can we help people develop the kinds of lives that they wouldn't want to kill other people. Yeah, I think you, you, you have articulated what Gandhi said about his beliefs, which were, if this isn't real, don't do it. Right. If this isn't real. If the idea of throwing love at someone doesn't have a power to it, you should toss it out. Right. And I'm also always looking for the partial truth on all sides. In other words, when I say things like, you know, God is just life in drag, or, or God is so big that God is just life, then what I'm really trying to say is, even the people with whom you most deeply disagree, there is a partial truth. God is speaking. God is speaking. Right? Okay, I really meant it. You know? Well, that's. I, I think I, he's liking I your point. I call it confirmation. <laughs> he and she and it is liking your point. Yeah. There's a partial truth even to the views of the people you most deeply disagree with. Mm. Sometimes mm. that. Tr I don't mean 50 50, I'm not a relativist. But it, even if it's an emotional truth. In other words, let's talk about the tea. If you think about the Tea Party, okay? I know what I disagree with the Tea Party. What I disagree with someone is always the easy stuff, mm. right? Mm. Uh, what I agree with someone, but it, what I disagree with someone. But what's really interesting is where's the partial truth of the Tea Party? What's the partial truth of that anger that that somehow we're not dealing with in a way that's healthy, and so it's producing this massive distortion? Mm. You know, what's the fears that they feel that actually are legitimate? Mm. That maybe we on the other side are poo-pooing or saying those aren't real fears and. And rather than recognizing that they're also our fears, we've allowed them to be the complete container of all our fears. Mm. And I think that's what a lot of what's going on right now. It's kind of like MSNBC 
people and Fox people, they are the shadow projection of each other. Mm. And one is allows the other one. MSNBC people allow the Fox people to be the container of all of our fears. Yes. We don't have to be afraid because we're above the fear because we're so morally and psychologically evolved. And Fox people wind up allowing uh, MSNBC people to be the container of all the hopes mm. because because we're not naive and if we're a Fox person we're not naive and we're so realistic and the fact is we're all a mixture of hopes and fears and hopes and fears and the better the much better way of operating a society is try to is operating a conversation with each other in which so tell me what your hopes and fears mm. are and, mm. and I'll tell you what my hopes and fears are and 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 then oh wow you know what the truth is, I'm a little afraid that too. I, I get that, as, a, mm. as opposed to you become the container of all the fears, you become the containers of all the hopes, and then let's yell at each other and entertain people. There, there's a quote that I love from Thomas Akempis: "Study to overcome that in yourself which disturbs you most in that, others." That's the point. And I, and I really feel that as you're saying that people on one side are so afraid to look at the side of themselves that disturbs them so much right so we artists are so afraid to look at that side that you would call a conservative who can be organized who can you know discipline. understand business and discipline we're so afraid of that and then the reverse is true too of this so I think it's in every field it's like that in politics and culture which are meaning making fields in a way mm -hmm. right they become really super heated mm -hmm. and uh, and there's a lot of things, I always say this to, to, to my liberal friends, I mean, I'm on the liberal side, but to my liberal friends who, you know, kind of, their backs get up to traditional people, I said, just remember, you have no inheritance without traditional people, mm, you mm. know? If you're an artist, the inheritance of the artistic traditions, if you're a musician, if you're a filmmaker, you've inherited film traditions, mm. and now whatever you do with them, you do with them, but thank God someone preserves. Mm. That's what traditionalists do, they preserve. And when we don't appreciate preservation, Preservation. You know what preservers do? They hold on to dear life mm. and hate any innovation. Mm. And on the other hand, what I say to traditional people is just remember every tradition, the traditions you love most, the traditions you are preserving, the traditions you're holding on for dear life, just remember every single tradition was an innovation at one moment. Mm. Every single one, I don't mm. care what it is, whether it's an artistic tradition, whether it's a classical music tradition, whether it's a religious tradition, Every single one was an innovation because all a mm. tradition is is an innovation that made it. Mm. So now let's talk. Now let's mm. talk. And that's where we need to go is conversation. And you know, I, as you were talking, speaking of holding on for dear life, so <laughs> Holbrook is behind you holding on for dear life. So let me end this interview by saying a quote from Thomas Merton: "Nothing, Thomas Merton, nothing has ever been said about God." that hasn't already been said better by the wind in the pine trees, mm. or in this mm. case, the wind in the, in the <laughs> mountain film tent. So, Erwin, yeah. thank you, brother. Thank you. What, a, thank what you an so honor much. to be with you.